Mic check. One, two. Tom, use your word. Hey, you. That's original freedom. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Original Freedom Podcast. My name is Scott Spooner. This is my brother Tom Spooner Tom and Nate Spooner Horry. Here. What's up, fellas? And um, not sure how long you'll be with us today because we never know how long we're going to take to get through these things. Um, and our goal in that is to do it as precise as possible and give you as much of our truth as we can in that time slot as it relates to our experience. So that's our one disclaimer. Uh, anything we state is our belief and um, we will have experience in it. And today, let's give you the bottom line up front um, and make sure that we are going to deliver something to you that you find value in. What we're going to talk about today uh, is going to be based in Tom and I's military experience. And then more importantly, uh, over the last going on nine years since we've been out. Yeah. Um, so almost 18 years now combined post-military, what we've seen um, is that the, the private sector civilians, folks that have never served, um, have a perception belief around ex-military, ex-special operations, ex-generals, colonels, you name it, whoever it is. Um, and the other thing that we've consistently seen is that there are folks transitioning out of the military that are way more capable out here in the private sector than they are aware of. Yeah, than they even know. Absolutely. So, you know, those two main segments being, so if you're out there and you own an organization you, or you're a hiring manager, your mid-level management, your C-suite, it doesn't matter. You're interacting now after how many years of sustained combat? 16. 16 years sustained combat. So everyone is interacting with veterans. Yeah. Um, and so, I believe, uh, I'm not going to say you need to know, what we're going to do today is inform you with uh, experience-based wisdom around how to assess what you're looking at, who you're dealing with whenever you're talking to ex-military folks, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And if you're out there getting out of the military, uh, more specifically what Tom and I have experienced in, which is U.S. Army Special Operations Forces. Um, we'd like to share with you, you know, what is possible out here, so to speak, in anything non-governmental, um, purely in the U.S. private sector. Um, and the, the, our truth around these subjects, uh, we're going to dispel some myths around what um, correlates properly in the ways of leadership, what really works well and what doesn't work well and how you can actually, in my, you know, belief and experience destroy an organization or portions of an organization by blindly adopting something that worked somewhere else and specifically in a militaristic environment. Um, And also, you know, equate our own stories of success and others that we know from an entrepreneurial standpoint or folks integrating well. Uh, And last but not least, really shift the perception around what ex-enlisted special operations, U.S. Army special operations uh, enlisted for bring to the table yeah. um, that far outweigh at times the, what the, the myth is around that it's officers who are always, uh, only officers, ex-officers are capable of going into the C-suite, they're more educated. So these types of myths is uh, what we're going to talk about. And Nate, you've been around us now for a while um, and heard us talk about all these topics. Where do you think we should kick it off? Well, I mean, just I would go into essentially the, the the bare bones, the fundamentals of of you know the myths that you're kind of debunking based on your experience today. Because I think off of that is going to be some learning about the differences in in ranks, where where guys come from within the military, and that kind of thing. So I think you'd have to start at why. Um, why are the perceptions the way that they are? Yeah, where do they begin? Um, where do they begin? So, you know, in, in our time working with, oh, ton, I wouldn't say tons, quite a few um, executive teams, many executives, mid-level management, um, on and on and on. It's often the questions, right? Hey, do you know so-and-so? Hey, did you know so-and-so? And they're usually referring to a speech general they officers. saw, almost always a general officer, um, that they immediately equate like, wow, this person's amazing. Or has to be because he was promoted to three-star general, four-star general, whatever it is. And uh, so that's one data point that they bring to the table around the question. Then they bring the data point that comes from Hollywood and movies. And and then, which is 
for the most part, most often uh, not accurate. And then they get it from books, which are extremely one-sided, polarizing, may or may not be accurate. Um, and then from snippets uh, of an inspiring speech, right? That's so, uh, I understand why they have this natural affinity and respect, yet behind all of that is um, a lot of ignorance. Um, yeah, because touching on the ignorance piece is, you know, in U.S. Army, every, and I'm going to quit saying U.S. Army, just know that everything that we say is about U.S. Army, because we were in the U.S. Army. Right. And that is... Uh, <laughs> Stay is, in uh, our lane. Is staying You're in our lane. You're saying that they, they don't operate the same. You're saying Army, Navy does not operate Yeah, everybody exactly has different same. command structures and influences and stuff. Cultures and, and cultures as and well. Cultures. But one of the huge successes of uh, special operations community is that it's heavily led and decisions being made from the enlisted ranks. Yeah. Uh, it's heavily driven uh, by non-commissioned officers versus commissioned officers. It's just uh, it's just how it it's why it's so successful. Obviously, you have to have those key premier officers in some of those jobs. Most of them are that way, sure. but some of them just get get by. <laughs> you know, hey, they're on a winning team, so they get promoted. And that's the same for our major ranks also. We're not just totally beating up officers. You know, any good NCO is going to beat up an officer. You know what I mean? It's worth it. It, it, it must be done. But we're not going to get into all of that <laughs> where we're going to stay away from it as much as we can. But that's one of the um, one of the things that I believe that, well, that I know that a lot of folks don't know is, hey, special operations and the success of it, because we hear a lot about it because it's very successful and conventional too, but we're just talking about it our lane. And that's, uh, and that's primarily because it's bottom up driven, you know, I mean, it is driven from uh, the guys on the ground that are making the decisions uh, that need to be made. And uh, that's, that's one of the, one of the education pieces sure. I think we'd like to have here. What are some of the ways that in your minds and your experiences that officers have fallen short? Like wh where do we get to that point where now you guys feel so you know, comfortable talking about or, or having seen it played out, having seen guys get to levels that they didn't, in your opinion, in your belief, does feel that they deserved? What, why, and what are some of those ways that you would kind of describe? I don't want to describe it as officers falling short. To me, it's more so to, to, to paint, um, to provide the experience that what, what civilians see and believe um, doesn't correlate the way they, that they think it does whether that be a command sergeant major as well, to Tom's yeah. point, you know. Um, and, and really, let's, let's also bring up the fact that it's no different, right? There's plenty of CEOs out there who shouldn't have never gotten the job, no different than there's plenty of generals that have never gotten the job. Yet, ironically enough, if I meet someone on the street and they say, I'm a CEO, it's like, that could mean what? Who gives a shit? Um, until I see what's up. Yet, a CEO on the street meets someone who says, I was an ex-general, and all of a sudden, Wow. Like, and they have no idea what that means, right? What the because, context of What the context is, because there's only a handful of operational commands at a general level. There's tons of others that are just general officer billets. So they, they, they haven't been making massive strategic decisions. They haven't led soldiers or, or individuals in two decades, right? So, you know, around that, the, the truth around that is really wasn't, that doesn't get told out here. It's just a blanket statement. And let's go back to the beginning of the why, yeah. right? It, it, this is not a us versus them thing because it's just been created over time and it starts back to the inception of our organized military. And I would say it all, goes all the way up through World War II um, in that it was true. Officers had educations, formal educations, mm -hmm. right? Enlisted soldiers didn't. The drafts that occurred, the masses were enlisted soldiers. So... And it was always known and there was this hierarchical structure that is, is very much so in place for control and necessarily so. Yeah. Right. So what's happened is we've allowed society at large has allowed the myth, the facts of the past to stay the truth of today. And, and that's where that's where it's wrong, because the facts of the past were that officers were better yeah. at formal education. Yeah. They did make tons more decisions because enlisted men the were not empowered to make decisions the way Tom and I were. 
I mean, let's face it. Fast forward. I was I had a, a tr- I was a troop sergeant major, and I didn't have a commander, which is unheard of. I yeah. didn't even have an officer in my chain of command. Um, rare, rare, you know. Yeah. But um, and so now, because of the sources being politicians, Hollywood, books of hero- heroism that may or may not be true, um, is how we've perpetuated this belief system, this limiting framework into the presence, it was still true. It's not, that's bullshit. Yeah. Because senior enlisted, I, I can don't speak only for in Tom, for, you know, back to where we came from, common to have a four year degree, equally common anymore for folks to have masters. Yeah. Um, and so now that myth's debunked, you have tons of college educated people. And to Tom's point, you have um, the best decision makers critical thinkers, um, planners. planners, right? Detailed planners on the face of this planet. I'll I have no problem saying that found in the senior enlisted ranks of army special operations, um, for t- eight, 10, 12 years. So who would I rather have? Would I rather have someone who's been leading people on a daily basis, making decisions on life and death in combat in high risk training, right? For eight, 10, 12 years or someone that came through there for two years was made to look great by all these other people. And that's just the reality of it. Any great officer that I had was one that understood that without execution, they don't win. And so it was not their job to come tell experts what to do. It was their job to have the wisdom to facilitate and maneuver and inspire good, right actions and decisions below. Yep. Right. And not make it about them. And that correlates straight into any good CEO I've dealt with. Yep. Right. Any good CEO out there that, that that understands they're successful only because of the execution going on at the ground level is more likely than not going to be a CEO who inspires followership. Right. And and understands that they are not where they are because of them. Um, and I, I go back and go to uh, Eisenhower's um, memoirs after D-Day invasion, uh, he stated and was quoted that, and then the world, the, the, the fate of the world rests in the hands of 18 year old mud sloggers, young sergeants and lieutenants. Yep. And he went to bed <laughs> because he, um, he, had that's, done his part. he had done his part and there's a need. Yeah. I, you know, I, one thing I will say, uh, the ratio of great leaders as it, as it comes to that, um, General officers, I'd say from 06 or and above, um, the vast majority are a byproduct of a bureaucracy that facilitates average people to reach high ranks. So that being said, what are some of the things that you see a disconnect in going from that role to private sector to corporate world? What are some of the ways that that doesn't necessarily translate the things that they did in the military? You know, there's that big difference and not to get into the leadership conversation piece Mm -hmm. of it, but it's just, it needs to be said as far as like, when it comes to those kind of position is like, Hey, are you looking for managers? Are you looking for leaders? You know what I mean? And then when you talk about leaders, uh, that are empowered and have authority, uh, to make people do what they tell them to do. It's like the simple version of, if it was someone that's a powerful, true leader, you know, I mean, as the people are doing because are they doing what I asked them to do because they have to, or are they doing it because they want to, you mm-hmm. know, cause that's a totally different human being sitting there. And someone could be very good at managing multi different things, you know, but, uh, but are they good at inspiring and, and creating that following and being like a powerful leader? And by that you're meaning that, in the military that you, you always had that fallback of ha- like someone having to do something, or is that what you're referencing? Or? And that's the difference between uh, that doesn't correlate, because that's what we're gonna talk a lot about also you know, later on, is like, hey, there's certain things that do not correlate between the military and the private sector. Uh, because the context of the military is, is that, hey, you have to do what you're told to do. You know what I mean? You're bound by law. Law. You know, like that's a, it's a have to do or justice. you can be brought up on charges. Mm-hmm. Like you disobey an order, you can go to jail, right? That's, <laughs> does that, that doesn't exist. That level of authority and empowerment 
backed by you know UCMJ you know does not does not exist out here so there's so within that context of the military and in that framework some things don't apply you know in the outside world yeah and and some things do um yeah you know, and and the only reason that we know this is because uh, we screwed some stuff up as well a lot and, and assumed <laughs> that you know what worked there works here what worked in you know Spec Ops is going to now turn around and work uh, as I'm consulting to private corporations. Some of it does, some of it doesn't. I am the one thing that the military's uh, constraint system, by the way, necessary. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely necessary. Perfect system. Right, you can't have uh, you can't have a, a team of Green Berets and have one of them walk in and say, "Hey, guy reached out to me on LinkedIn, doubled my salary, I'm out." <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, so I just described that therein lies the difference. Yeah. That fucking simple, right? It's um, to effectively lead, not control, not manipulate, not intimidate, right? Effectively, effectively lead through, you know, actually inspiring others. Out here in the corporate environment, corporate world, from small corporations to the biggest, it's irrelevant. Um, you cannot force people to do what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. You can't hold them to account because free will exists as a civilian and that does not exist in the military, right? So how is it possible, truthfully, that if you've had someone that have, that, that it's, have led under those rules for 20 plus years, that they're not gonna bring that mentality into an organization? Mm -hmm. Unless they have the wisdom not to, which would be rare. It would take time. You have to understand it. But what's more important is that the folks hiring people, and especially you brought it up, these, you know, I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. It's, it's almost as nauseating have, as have you read the last Navy SEAL book? Um, <laughs> and, you know, do you know General so and so? And in, in my mind, it's like I want to throw up in my mouth because sometimes it's people that, that these, these are external officers that have horrible reputations from those they've led. Mm -hmm. Horrible reputations. Um, yet the outside world, it, it's irrelevant. Um, and it, it comes back to why do you want these people on your board? Ask yeah. for this. Get out of your head. Like no one... It, it, when I hear the term, we need to hire more veterans, once again, why? I mean, that's an irresponsible thing to say. That's like- For I just need, that reason. For just that reason. It's like, no, we need to hire the right people. That's what we did in special operations. We hired the right people. Yeah. We didn't even say we need to hire more people out of the Ranger Regiment. We need to hire more people out of wherever. We said we, all, we need to hire the right people. Wherever they come Wherever from. they come from. Because we know what our culture is. We know what we need. We invest the time up front and how we actually assess. We make sure we've got training processes in place. So all we need is the right piece of clay, right? So it's always interesting to me that there's this natural correlation you know, that, that just because someone did X, they can do Y. And then the inverse of that, just because someone was enlisted, they can't do Y. Right. Right. And there and therein lies the myth. And I think Tom has a great story that highlights what... Um, so where does this happen? First of all, and then I think I think asking Tom to tell his story. It happens in the private sector at times when senior executives or even mid-level executives end up having someone at a lower level bring them an idea, mm -hmm. and because that person doesn't have the PhD, doesn't have whatever credentials are, it is assumed that odds are, you know, that these people will see like, yeah, you know, great ideas come from the bottom, but really, how you know, are they listening? Um, and truly looking at everyone as an equal. And that's the other thing. It's like, if I'm a good leader, I can look at everyone as an equal. We can have debate because leadership happens when decisions need to be made. That's when you will know yep. who's in charge until then. Like, but really, do we do that? And sometimes uh, Tom's got a great story that highlights to where you um, have to conceal the truth to get things done at times because that because exists. of prejudice and false false beliefs. beliefs. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so the uh, story Scott was talking about was, uh, you know, as an uh, enlisted guy in special operations, a lot of times given and empowered with the authority to make decisions at 
uh, strategic at a strategic <laughs> level. Sometimes at the general officer level, but for sure, you know, I mean, colonels and, and below. You know, what I mean, just because that was our job description, that's what we, the bill that we filled. And but but in the military, we know there's a hierarchy system, like you already said. It's like, hey, that it's supposed to be that way. But one of because I was empowered, not just me, but all of us alike, the way of getting things done uh, was by hiding my rank sometimes. Again, back to prejudices and belief systems, you know, I mean, within the military. So uh, for an example, let's say if I had a, a, you know, a target packet together, I had all the assets together, everything that we needed to do to conduct an operation, except I didn't have the people. <laughs> so I would have to go to this brigade commander, you know, usually a full bird, sometimes uh, a battalion commander, whichever, and go to him and say, hey, I have this operation, I have this you know, all the, everything that we needed to conduct operation except for the short planning purposes and utilizing their per personnel. And, uh, and the only way that I could get that done without question um, was to introduce myself as Tom. With a beard, you know, no patches. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's no, so I didn't totally... have any rank or anything on me. And it was, um, so that way, you know what I mean, whether it was a sergeant major, a brigade sergeant major, whether it was a colonel, whoever it was, we left all the bullshit out of the way. Like, what? Who cares what my rank was? Who cares? What mattered was is I had accurate information, a complete plan, ready to execute. Just need the people. Let's get it done now. So when we removed all those preconceived ideas, prejudice, belief systems, and stuff, it was, we were just left with the truth of the matter, which was, hey, wow, this is great intel. This is great. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go do it. Like, hey, just then we kicked in a timeline and got it done. So that's what, you know, one of the reasons why we're talking about all this stuff is, is that it's to break those prejudices and preconceived yeah. ideas or just ignorance, you know, I mean, uh, of doing that. And that's just an example of how that got done on the battlefield. Uh, and back to Scott's example uh, for all of us, you know what I mean? When someone that is of lower rank, you know what I mean? Or, or lower experience, you know, comes to the table with like, Hey, I have this information and it's based off of these facts. Like for me not to listen to that because of prejudice or whatever I believe to be, it is unintelligent. Man, it's 2018. Um, <laughs> what I mean by that times have changed. Yeah. Like, and, and, and all of the, and we have real problems going on that need real solutions, you know? Absolutely. And it's, and it's about, uh, it's thinkers. I, you know, I had a, a buddy who's a CFO, you know, several years ago, Jeff, mm -hmm. uh, said to me, he's like, man, the only thing I want to hire Scotty, if you can find me is people who can get shit done. Mm -hmm. He didn't say I need a college education. He didn't say, he's like people that can get shit done. And what does that mean? That means people who have courage to take risk at times when others wouldn't have courage to make hard decisions that are, are more so unpopular decisions. Um, and whenever, whenever you start talking about the number, I'm here to tell you that the corporate sector has access to um, every one of these ex operational people. When I, yeah. when I say ex operators, I mean, it doesn't matter if, if it's from out of any special operations forces within the U S army from yeah. uh, helicopter pilots to Green Berets to operational folks that, you know, it doesn't matter. These are people that know how to make critical decisions better, faster, with a predictable outcome than anybody in the world. And the irony of it is, is the people that executives are going after are at the top, usually, who lack actually what they need, are used to leading and can lead through intimidation. So that tool's gone for them. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they pass, so to speak on the ones that don't have the pedigree yet could do the job. Right. Right. Digging more on that. I mean, why, what are the things, you know, specifically that NCOs, you know, the guys, the enlisted guys you're talking about, the qualities the, that really separate them and why, you know, they would do so well in that type of environment? Multiple reasons. Um, I mean, how many generals do you need? Just like saying, how many CEOs do you need, right? There, there's so few, right? Of th that requirement is so few from a numbers piece and critical, yes. But what's really needed in every organization I've consulted to over the past nine, eight years, going on nine, fucking, it's no different than where we came from. The model's always the same. Always the same. 
from mid all the way down and frontline execution begins at frontline leaders, managers, more often known as managers, right? But at the end of the day, it's still leadership, right? And it's the kind of leadership that you will find at the senior enlisted level. Um, and I would say, um, I'll, you know, I'll say the best officers I ever served under and wanted to follow, um, almost all, and I'm only thinking of two right now, got out after 10 to 11 years. And the reason they got out as majors, uh, as senior captains, majors, some of them stayed to like Colonel, um, is they didn't want to deal with the bullshit and politics of what it takes to just climb the officer ranks. They actually wanted to be on the ground with the execution elements leading and on the, you know, not always on the battlefield, but sometimes mostly there, right? And they literally, so, you know, my belief system would be folks out there, you're, you're actually usually going to find a better product of someone that left because what that tells you, they had the courage to leave usually. They didn't want to just ride it out for a, 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 a retirement and the potential of having a lot of ability to say they were X. They're done. These are go-getters, right? With exception. Yeah. Um, and so what, what does that leave? And what's that mean? Well, that everything is done by the senior enlisted. They are the ones who are the experts on the ground. They are the ones who problem are solving. problem solving. And this is where the myth, why we say special operations forces only. What Tom described to you in that story is not being done in conventional forces. That's no ding on them. It can't be done, yeah. right? Yet the level of responsibility that is put on special operations soldiers, everything from showing up in countries, dealing with the ambassador uh, immediately, you know, from suit and tie back into fatigues, whatever it is, you have to be this um, nimble and this agile as a senior enlisted in spec ops, because the job description is one thing, but guess what? The next day, it doesn't matter. It's, it's what needs to be done next. Back to the problem solving. How? We have to tackle this with limited resources. You know, how? Make it happen. Figure yeah. it out. Be resourceful. What do you have for leverage? And that's, you know, all the way from our time in, as Green Berets, which is, you know, learning, understanding unconventional warfare and, and, and how to use force, force multiplication, right? Um, they are hands down why we succeed at the execution point, which is all that matters. Yeah. Eisenhower said it best. Like at the end of the day, he made the call and then he actually said he was rendered useless. And I, I remind senior executives that it's like, okay, the best plans you have in the world are fucking irrelevant if your people are not truly inspired to ex execute them in the manner that which they were made. Yeah. Because you can't force them. And back to what's different, you can't, I've seen it whenever, whenever you know, this is a, they, they, there wasn't an HR department in the army. <laughs> no, you know, they no, didn't. you know, Dan Walker always referred to, and he was one of our first business mentors out here. Uh, he says human capital. Yeah. This world out here is a game of human capital. Absolutely. And loyalty is everything. And true inspirational leadership is what garners loyalty and followership, right? And I'm here to tell you, there's many people who had successful careers in the military that the tactics that they used, the way they led there, would destroy any private sector organization. Because it's out of the context it's of the military. Absolutely out. So for the folks that are here and hey, do it this way because we are this and you can be that. And most of the time it's bullshit because it doesn't work. Like how do I, you know, if I'm out in the Silicon Valley area and I'm, I'm running an organization that's uh, technical by nature and you're one of my high end coders, like what's going to keep you from finally taking that LinkedIn email from somebody in Apple that says, Nate, we can double what you got right now and you can start tomorrow. Because at the end of the day, you're a critical part of my organization. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, that's what, and I see in organizations that we work with, they're losing people left and right because they do not garner loyalty. Uh, so if you take someone that's naturally always have force as a tool, <laughs> what do you they take do? away their biggest tool. You take away their biggest tool. 
And I'd say 80%, you know, I mean, I, I can honestly say I always, I mean, it was comforting knowing I had that trump card. Mm -hmm. Oh right. yeah. At the end they, of the day. At the end of the day and also knowing I was ultimately responsible as well. Absolutely. So it's played when it necessary. Um, but I would say there are many people that led successfully. They led because they played the trump card over and over again. And this will be known as the asshole CEOs as well. The ones who have to remind everyone who they are and what's going on. So, and the other thing too, Nate, that you brought up or that question that you asked is, uh, when it comes to hiring <laughs> some of question, the, the question is, uh, is, you know, don't also, whenever it comes to the piece of, of and back to the myth of like, Hey, yeah, don't hire a veteran just because he's a veteran. Like back to what you were saying, Scott, it's like, Hey, have in your mind, Hey, it's wonderful. We promote, please promote veterans. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Please hire veterans. You know I mean? That deal. But the, our take on it too is, is, but only if they're qualified for the job, you know what I mean? Don't give them a pass, you know, because if they're worth their salt, uh, and not riding on some entitlement mentality, you know what I mean? Just like you, we were talking about earlier where it's like, Hey, in special operations, no one cares about your last mission. No one cares about what you did yesterday. Yeah. It's like, Hey, what are you doing now? Now, I mean, there's street cred to all of that, you know, in your past performance and all that stuff. But it's like, Hey, I did, I don't hire folks just cause they're veterans. Hire them because uh, they're veterans. Hey, that's great. But they also meet the job descriptions that you're hiring them for, you know, which is really all that we've talked about it from the CEO board member kind of level all the way down to, to, to bottom line hiring. You know what I mean? It's hire the people that fit the description for your job.